of Big Bang cosmology is the idea that the universe originated from a chaotic explosion. And uh, that is the farthest from the truth. When we look at the expansion of the universe from the cosmic creation event, it's the most fine-tuned uh, design feature we can measure in all of the sciences. Welcome to Biblical Diman, and today our guest is astronomer Dr. Hugh Ross, who is the founder and president of Reasons to Believe, an organization dedicated to integrating scientific fact and biblical faith. His books include Weathering Climate Change, uh, Why the Universe the Way It Is, and Navigating Genesis. Dr. Hugh Ross, it's a joy to have you here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so since you come from the science background, and uh, so tell us a little background on how you came to believe in God, especially Christianity, why not the other religions? Sure. Well, I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. I now live in the U.S. Uh, and I really didn't get to know any Christians growing up. They're hard to find in Canada. Uh, but I got interested in astronomy when I was seven years of age. And I knew from the age of eight onwards that astrophysics would be my future career. And I was reading like five books on physics and astronomy a week. And uh, every year I would do a different subdiscipline of astronomy. It was at age 16 that I studied cosmology. And that's when I realized that of all the different models to explain the origin history of the universe, the one that was best fitting the data was the Big Bang. And if it's Big Bang, there's a beginning. If there's a beginning to the universe, there must be a beginner. And so at age 17, I went on a search to find that cosmic beginner. And I looked for him first in the writings of Immanuel Kant and Rene Descartes and discovered they didn't have the correct uh, cosmic concepts. So I put those aside. Then I began to look at the different holy books that regard the world's religions, looked at the Hindu Vedas, the Quran, uh, looked at the Buddhist commentaries, uh, looked at uh, the Mormon scriptures, uh, Baha'i, and I discovered that none of them were able to successfully predict future historical events or future scientific discoveries. And I found in those books a lot of scientific and historical errors. And so finally, I did pick up a Bible. Uh, I was given a Bible by the Gideons when I was in the public school system in Canada. And it began to go through that uh, Gideon Bible. And two things struck me about that Gideon Bible. Uh, number one, it got all the creation events uh, in the early chapters of Genesis correctly stated and the correct chronological order. And I was particularly impressed that it precisely followed the scientific method in describing the events of creation. Uh, and then as I read further in the Bible, I discovered that it predicted the four fundamental features of Big Bang cosmology thousands of years before astronomers even had a hint that the universe uh, had a beginning of space and time, or that it continuously expanded from a space-time beginning, uh, or that the laws of thermodynamics were pervasive throughout the universe. And so I realized this book's got predictive power. This really could be a message from the one that created the universe. But I spent nearly two years carefully going through the entire Bible searching for provable uh, errors and contradictions. I found lots of passages I didn't understand, but I couldn't establish a single provable error of contradiction. And I found hundreds of places where the Bible had accurately, uh, without error, uh, predicted future historical events and future scientific discoveries. So it was at age 19, I signed my name in the back of the Gideon Bible, uh, committing my life to Jesus Christ and began to look for opportunities to share my Christian faith. And uh, years later, I got to meet Christians when I showed up at Caltech to do postdoctoral research. They showed me how to find a church. That church put me on their pastoral staff. And a few years later, they helped me launch Reasons to Believe. Wow, that's wonderful to hear that, uh, you know, you're very familiar with all of the religions, as you mentioned, that Hindu Vedas, Baha'i and Islam. Uh, so basically one question comes to mind when uh, we talk about religion with the science that science contradict religion. 
So does the Bible actually contradict science? I found no contradictions with science. Uh, rather, uh, what I found were exhortations in Job and Psalms, that the more we learn about the record of nature, the more evidence we'll see for the supernatural handiwork of God. Uh, the Bible tells us that we're to study two books, uh, the book of scripture and the book of nature, that God reveals himself through both books. And in my 40 years of studying the book of nature and the book of scripture, uh, I have yet to find a conflict or a contradiction. It doesn't mean I don't find anomalies, things that don't fit uh, my you know, biblical worldview. But as I research those anomalies, they get resolved. And when they get resolved, they reveal more anomalies. But I look at that as God's way of encouraging me to dig deeper than I otherwise would dig. And that's what's fun for me, is pursuing all the anomalies in science, the anomalies in theology, and seeing how the more we learn, the tighter fit we get between the book of nature and the book of scripture. Wow, wonderful and great to hear that. As you mentioned the Big Bang, I heard you speaking on Big Bang and it is one of the theories which draw people away from God. Basically, atheists, you know, keep that flag, oh, Big Bang uh, was an accident and came from nothing. So how do you respond to the Big Bang theory with the Bible? I mean, what examples and what evidences we have? Well, a lot of people look at Big Bang cosmology as the idea that the universe originated from a chaotic explosion. And uh, that is the farthest from the truth. When we look at the expansion of the universe from the cosmic creation event, it's the most fine-tuned uh, design feature we can measure in all of the sciences. The most spectacular evidence uh, for divine uh, fine-tuning comes in looking at the Big Bang creation model. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Bible in many places states all the fundamental features of the Big Bang. I mean, what impressed me as a young man is that uh, not until the 20th century did any astronomer even have a hint that the universe expands. And yet 11 passages in the Bible tell us uh, that God has expanded the universe from a creation event. And he's continuously expanding it, puts it in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means God designed it in the very beginning with the property of ongoing cosmic expansion. And uh, you see in the book of Job, God alone stretches out the heavens, uh, making the point that he is in control. And we astronomers measure the, uh, the rate of that fine tuning. It literally ranks as one of the most spectacular evidences we have uh, for fine tuning design. And I think too, a lot of people uh, pick up the Bible and they think it's teaching a rather young age for the universe. Uh, but you know, if you read, I mean, when I first read Genesis, I noticed that they have six creation days. Each of them have a start point and an end point, a beginning and an ending, an evening and a morning. But there is no start point or end point. Well, there is a start point for the seventh day, uh, but there's no evening morning phrase for the seventh day. And you see texts in uh, Hebrews 4 and Psalm 95 that tell us we're still in God's seventh day. Uh, and as a scientist, I realize the Bible says God creates for six days and stops creating on the seventh day. And in the entire human era of existence, we see no evidence for God's supernatural intervention in nature. He is resting, but we do see it before the human era. For six days, he creates. On the seventh day, he stops. And therefore, I see no conflict between the 13.8 billion years that Big Bang cosmology tells us the universe has been in existence and what the Bible teaches on the time scale of creation. Wonderful, wonderful. So you say, I mean, some of the young creationists argue that uh, Earth is 6,000 years old, but uh, with scientific proofs, you're saying that it's actually the billion years old and it is can be uh, based on the biblical evidences that God rested on the seventh day. Right. I would say there's not only overwhelming evidence in astronomy and physics that the universe and Earth are billions of years old. You get the same overwhelming case for an old earth and an old universe, looking at the biblical text. And what I challenge Christians to do, 
don't just look at one text in the Bible. It's 66 books. And you know, given that this is the Word of God, uh, one book of the Bible cannot contradict another book of the Bible. Read it literally and consistently. I believe the creation texts in the Bible are meant to be read literally, but they're also meant to be read consistently. And from that perspective, it's clear uh, that the Bible is not teaching that the universe and the earth are only 6,000 years old, but much, much older. And you got texts in the Bible that talk about how ancient the mountains and hills are and the Kidron River is. And uh, incidentally, I don't think the people living 3,000 years ago were that ignorant of science. I mean, uh, you have David in the wilderness, and there he is uh, with these mountains and sees the piles of rubble at the bottom and uh, realizes that there had to be forces in effect for a very, very long period of time to explain the geology that he was observing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the, the debate should not be on the young and uh, old creation is but should be why and when you know not on when but why it has right. been yeah i heard well, you, you, see yeah. That, you see that in the writings of the early church fathers they wrote over two thousand pages of commentary on genesis one less than two pages deals with the time scale most of their commentary is on who creates and how he creates and that's yeah. crucial in terms of what christianity is talking about Notice a date for the earth of the universe is not in any of the creeds of the Christian church. It's not an essential doctrine. And therefore, the age of the earth should never be an issue that divides Christians against one another. Unfortunately, it does. And incidentally, that's been the way it's been throughout all the church history. Christians have this habit of dividing and fighting over non-essential issues. And you see that in Acts 15 the church was split over circumcision. And today we know that that is not an essential doctrine, nothing to fight over, but people did back in those days. Mm, yeah, correct. I mean, that was, uh, I just, I will just go through that if I get ever a chance on that. You just mentioned that 2000 pages on one first chapter, right? Yeah, great. So it's wonderful to hear all these compelling arguments and the evidences on the existence of God. But one question comes to every person, whether believer or non-believer, and this question is personal and experiential. That if God, then why sufferings? If God what? Sufferings. Oh, on sufferings. Yeah, well, uh, what impressed me is that uh, the Bible tells us that God's goal is to eradicate evil and suffering once and for all while he enhances the free will capability of humans who choose redemption to experience and express love, which means our free will must be put to a test. And what impressed me when I first read the Bible, it says, this is the God that created the universe. Uh, he could have locked Satan out of planet Earth forever if he wanted to. Instead, he invited Satan to come into the Garden of Eden he was the most powerful creature that God ever made, the most intelligent. I think God knew that Adam and Eve were no match for uh, Satan, but it gave the human species the opportunity to be subjected to the most challenging test in the context of evil and suffering. And God explains, he says, you can't pass this test on your own, but I'm here to help you. I'm more powerful than Satan. I'm more intelligent, knowledgeable than Satan. I will help you do what you can't do for yourself. And that's what really impressed. I saw that in no other holy book. It was unique to the Bible. And I said, you know, this makes sense that God would temporarily expose us to suffering so that we can be permanently delivered from suffering while our free will is enhanced rather than diminish. God doesn't want relationships with robots. He wants relationships with free will beings. His goal is to expand the expression of his love. You know, and that required exposing us to the most challenging tests. But the thing that amazes me as a Christian and as an astrophysicist is how quickly God is eradicating evil and suffering. And we're told that once evil is gone, we're gonna be delivered into a realm 
where there'll be no thermodynamics, there'll be no death, there'll be no suffering. And as I read through the Bible, I realized death is a crucial tool to deliver us from evil. And so death is in place right now. Uh, we have decay, we've got thermodynamics, we've got gravity and electromagnetism. You know, one of the books I wrote, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, explains why the physics of the universe must be exactly the way it is uh, for God to eradicate evil and suffering quickly while he enhances our free will. And by the way, that's the one book that I've written that has actually been published in India, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. Great, great. I will definitely have a book. Uh, I will definitely read that book. Uh, it's really uh, interesting to know that Bible is the only scripture which actually justifies the suffering. Uh, suffering tells us the presence of God, not the absence of God. So, yeah, wonderful to hear that. And uh, uh, Christians believe that Jesus uh, is God and he's the one through him and for him everything is created. Uh, so, question is apart uh, from apart from God being the creator, what sort of picture does Jesus manifest about God? Well, we're just talking about suffering. I think the thing that impressed me looking at the person of Jesus in the Gospels and the Epistles in the New Testament is his compassion. I mean, I don't think anyone can read the New Testament without being impressed just how incredibly compassionate a Jesus of Nazareth is and basically has the message that he was willing to suffer in order to show compassion towards us to deliver us from sin and evil. And I love what he says in the epistles, uh, that he intends that our suffering would be something that would bring us joy. I mean, we all look at suffering as something as painful, we wanna get rid of it. And we got James saying, no, consider it pure joy. And I think the analogy that works best for me you know, as a professor, my job is to make my students suffer. Uh, I train them, and uh, part of that training involves a lot of suffering. But what I've noticed is my best students want to suffer more. They recognize the benefits they're going to gain from all the challenging assignments I give them. And so they're coming to me and saying, can you give us more? Because they're so eager to learn. And they recognize this is going to prepare them for a future career. Likewise, the suffering we go through as Christians right now opens up doors for us to minister the compassion of Christ to others and prepares us for our future careers in the new creation. And, but Jesus gives us the example. He is the one that suffered more than any one of us, but was able to suffer and experience that joy in the suffering. Yeah, indeed, that Jesus is the example of how man should live a life uh, and how he rejoiced in the, in the, you know, during the sufferings, how he's been faithful to Lord and God. Uh, it's wonderful to hear that. And uh, I actually come across with this question a lot that, uh, I mean, especially I would like to ask an advice for, from you that what advice would you give to the Christian youth in today's time where information and knowledge is easily accessible through internet and, uh, you know, youngsters, especially youngsters, they get influenced by other worldviews and, you know, they keep the thing of Bible is not something for us, the world. So how do you, how, what advice you want to give to us? Well, I get people all the time uh, engaging me on Facebook and Twitter and saying, what do you think about this internet article? Mm -hmm. uh, usually, in, in my case, they're talking about somebody writing about a scientific discovery. And I said, not everybody who claims to be an expert on the internet is actually an expert. And therefore you need to look at their credentials and you need right. to see if they actually cite uh, a peer reviewed paper. I tell people, if you see an article about a scientific discovery in the web and they don't give you a link to the peer reviewed uh, paper on which it is based, do not trust it. Uh, any reputable journalist will give you a link. Uh, and moreover, take advantage of websites like PubMed and uh, the NASA archive website, uh, because what they'll do is they'll give you an archive of all the scientific research papers published on a particular subject. And this way you can determine, okay, this paper that got published, 
is it an outlier? And uh, what do the other scientists say about the discovery? Because science advances through scientists critiquing one another. Uh, so look at that. And by the way, I think the same thing applies to articles on theology and religion. Yeah. I actually want to see, okay, this claim was made. Uh, what do people uh, who have similar education say about that claim? You need to see what the consensus is. And incidentally, I'm not saying you always should believe the consensus, but you need to at least look at it. Uh, yeah. So, for example, I've seen a number of discoveries where only, say, 30% of the scientists think it has credibility, 70% do not, but 30% is a big percentage. Now, if it's only 0.003%, then I'd say this is actually a quack. I mean, yeah. if it's not generating any more and more support than that, this is something that certainly is uh, not worth pursuing. But anything that gets more than, say, 10% support, that means this actually could be right. This is worth checking out. And let's see if it eventually becomes 90%. And that's what happened with Big Bang Cosmology. It started off with very little support, but in just a few years, it wound up getting virtually universal support. Yeah, well said. And really, we need to uh, look out for the more deep informational, you know, whatever is being published on the internet. And as you said, the, take the consensus and also discern with the, with the Bible, with the evidences of the Bible. So do you think that apologetics is required in today's time? And if yes, then tell us your experience, uh, you know, uh, as an apologist, how it influenced the non-believers, especially the non-believers. Well, it's hard for anyone who doesn't yet believe that there is a God to become a believer until they see the evidence for that God. And so I find that people who don't have a lot of exposure to the Bible, the Christian faith, they need this evidence. And moreover, uh, the Bible tells us that becoming a Christian means becoming public about your commitment to Jesus Christ, which means you need to be prepared to answer questions. And you see in Peter's first letter, he says, always be prepared to give good reasons for the faith and hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Because you never know when someone's going to come up to you and say, you know, what proof do you have? What evidence do you have? And so every Christian should be prepared to give good reasons. Moreover, what I've discovered is if you will prepare good reasons, and Peter says, share those reasons with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. If you can share those reasons with Christian demeanor, you will see God supernaturally bringing people to you. You know, one of the books I read, I think I got it on my shelf here. Uh, let me see if I can pull it down here for you. Yeah, here it is. This book, Always Be Ready, uh, where I basically share this principle that if you will prepare good reasons and share it with gentleness, respect, and a pure conscience, God will supernaturally bring people to you, just like you see in the book of Acts. Yeah. And basically, I share in this book stories, hundreds of stories of how God has supernaturally worked. I mean, just in my own case, I've been able to share my Christian faith uh, literally with hundreds of scientists and theologians. And when I'm on airplanes, I've, what I've noticed is over half the conversations I have with people about the Christian faith are with people with doctoral degrees in the sciences or theology. And you and I both know that doesn't make up 50% of the flying public. Uh, God supernaturally seats me right next to someone else who has that similar background. Uh, one of the stories I share in this book is how God put me uh, in, right next to the person who is a German quantum uh, uh, physicist who is an atheist, and uh, he had questions. And he basically said right away, who are you? And I said, well, I'm from Canada, not Germany. Uh, I'm not a quantum physicist, but an astrophysicist. I'm not an atheist. I'm a Christian. And he said, well, I've got questions for you. And what was interesting, he asked me eight questions over a two-hour flight. And he said, wow. how come you've got such well-prepared answers to my questions? I said, well, your questions are the chapter titles in the book I wrote. He said, I don't believe you. But I had a copy of that book in my briefcase. 
and I gave it to him. He looked at the table of contents and says, you're right. These are the questions that I asked you. And that book was why the universe is the way it is. Wonderful, wonderful. It's really we as Christians, we need to be always be prepared for the hope we have in Christ. So, so, yeah, it was an insightful talk and you and your organization, Reasons to Believe, is really doing a good job. Uh, Dr. Ross, thank you once again uh, for coming to Biblical Demand. Well, it's been my pleasure. We'll, uh, we'll definitely be praying for you. Thank you, sir.